Hi everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, I am Antonina Mamzenko and I'm here today with Alice Chapman. Hi. Emma Collins. Hi. And Diana Hakes. Hi. Uh, and we'll talk to you about documentary family photography. Um, a little bit about us before we get started. So all four of us, we are professional documentary family photographers with over 30 years experience between us. We are mentors and we are co-founders of Made for Documentary, uh, a community and education hub for photographers who are interested in the genre. Uh, today, we'll introduce you to this relatively new but very exciting way of photographing families, explain why clients love it and share some tips on how you can try it yourself. Uh, please use the chat function to um, ask questions along the way. Um, we won't monitor it while we speak, but we'll hopefully have some time after the main presentation to answer some of your questions. So do pop them in there. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, Diana, what is documentary family photography? Right. Thanks, Antonina. Well, documentary family photography is where photojournalism meets family. Uh, we're not talking about capturing candid moments um, within a lifestyle shoot. We're actually talking about the entire approach to the shoot itself. And because of its links to photojournalism, there's this accepted code of ethics, which this genre of family photography follow. Um, and there's some rules um, which might seem a bit strange at first, but just bear with us. Um, it's important to remember that the less contrived your approach is, the more authentic your images will be. And it is this that differentiates the genre of family photography from other styles uh, that clients will come to understand and love. Now, Alice is actually going to tell you more about some of the rules that we as documentary family photographers follow. Alice. Yeah, thank you. So we don't pose, prompt or direct our clients. We'll work with them before the shoot to talk through ideas about what activities they might do, where they might go and what they'd love us to capture. But on the day, we try not to influence what happens. We also don't change things in the environment. So we don't move things out of the way to get a clean shot. We'll move ourselves and we'll move our cameras to include or exclude what we want in the frame. In documentary family photography, we often actually want to include the clutter of family life because it can contextualize the moment we're capturing. So we genuinely don't worry about things looking messy. Similarly, we don't change things in post. So we don't clone things out or crop too heavily. And our editing tends to be very natural so that what we see in the final image actually looks like real life. Some people use presets, but the colours tend to look natural and we don't use digital effects like shopping in a more interesting sky. We want our images to be authentic and to look authentic and following these rules actually helps us achieve that. But Emma, there are some misconceptions about the rules sometimes, aren't there? Absolutely. Um, traditional and lifestyle family photography put the control of every part of a session into the hands of the photographer. So location choices, outfits, light and interactions, they're all directed to a certain extent to make things, um, to make pretty images that focus on the aesthetic. Working within the constraints of the code means that we relinquish the control of these directed elements. So for many photographers, there's a fear that real life will simply look like a series of messy snapshots. But as family photojournalists, our job is to make sense of the chaos and honor reality in a sensitive but beautiful way. And it's actually a really wonderful challenge. We have to skillfully mix our photographic expertise and our observations of family life and try to construct uniquely personal and artful images. So, Actually, in reality, shifting away from focusing on perfection and concentrating instead on how to tell the story gives you remarkable freedom. You can go back to the definition of being creative and make something unexpected or extraordinary. Uh, we're going to take you through some images now and talk more about why our clients love being documented. Antonina? Yes, um, one of the reasons uh, clients really love this approach is because it's really easy for them. Um, 
unlike with a traditional or lifestyle family photo shoot where families are expected to make special arrangements, put on nice clothes, clean the house, um, with documentary family photo shoot, um, it centers around capturing families' usual routine, usual day or a portion of their day. So, um, you know, there's no length of a photo shoot that makes a documentary. It can be full day, it can be just a couple of hours. Uh, but the fact that it's centered around families' usual routine means that they can relax in the knowledge that whatever happens on the day is absolutely fine. You know, they don't have to fit a photo shoot into their schedule. Uh, we can follow them anywhere, be it a playground or museum or, you know, a dance, dance recital. Uh, and we can incorporate nap times, snack times, or even, even toddler tantrums into the shoot. It's all part of real family life. Um, I know from experience that families who don't want the pressure of posing in the field somewhere or don't like the idea of wrapping babies for a newborn photo shoot, they really, really resonate with this approach. Um, and even reluctant dads, who are usually the hard ones to crack when it comes to family photography, they will absolutely love the fact that they don't have to do anything special and that's all that's required of them is to just to be a parent like they would be on any given day. Uh, but our clients don't just love the genre because it's easy for them. Um, the photos are also so much more meaningful for them, aren't they, Diana? Uh, yes. So clients love this approach because we're creating these tangible records of their life before their kids grow up, documenting the mums and the dads doing normal everyday stuff with their kids. And this shows them how much they are loved. Um, and because as documentary family photographers, we don't control how the shoot will go and just let the moments unfold. It means that we can ca capture a variety of emotions and interaction that make these photos much more personal to them. We are making photos that tell the story of family life at a particular moment in time, where they can see themselves, how they looked and felt, what they did that hopefully will make them smile and also to see the funny, quiet and even the difficult moments too. And this has been found to actually have a real positive impact on people's mental health, which Emma, you know from your personal viewpoint, um, having had a background in lifestyle photography, yeah, that's right. I used to just share images that I thought people would want to see. Shots of perfect interiors, pretty outfits. I'd constantly be trying to find amazing new locations um, to try and compete with what I was seeing out there. And if I didn't have a client, I'd even drag my children out because I thought the light was perfect. Um, but in the end, this just fed into feelings that I didn't live in a pretty enough area, that my life wasn't good enough, I was a mediocre photographer. Of course, all these negative thoughts um, were complete rubbish. Um, I was just putting pressure on myself because that's what I was seeing. So eventually it gave me a real eureka moment. The world is an interesting place because we're all different. I adore my family. I'm really lucky. Why can't I just celebrate who we are, warts and all, and be really proud of that? There's so much pressure to strive for a perfect, desirable lifestyle. And if we only photograph the good stuff, we're perpetuating this unhealthy pursuit of an unattainable life. But by capturing, capturing people's reality, we can show them that what they have might not conform to expectations of perfection, but it is their perfect. And actually their life is more colorful and much richer because of their own unique experiences. And actually, the wonderful thing about it, it can really lead to hilarious results, can't it, Alice? Yes, definitely. So one of my favourite things to include in my images is humour. And there's huge potential for this in our genre. The key is in enabling families to be themselves. And as Antonina talked about, having sessions at home, which include the normal routine, is really easy for parents. And it's that that makes it easy for them to be themselves. So if your clients are doing their own thing, there's every chance of funny moments playing out right in front of you without you having to do anything to create them because real family life is naturally very playful. Like this image we can see on the top left with the dad in the shark costume. This was a regular family, um, regular Saturday morning at home for this family. And capturing this moment for me was a way of championing that family's unique sense of humor. 
kids are naturally very funny of course especially when they're not on their best behavior i always feel that if children are sitting still for photo or being given direction then we're missing a trick in seeing what we, they'd get up to if left to their own devices so i always tell my clients that best behavior is optional but as much as family life can be fun anyone who's a parent and we're all parents here knows that the idea of enjoying every moment is complete rubbish parenting is really hard and we embrace that rather than shy away from it in this genre I especially love to capture funny images of moments that actually feel quite difficult at the time. In the top middle here, we can, we can see a photo by Antonina of a mum breastfeeding a baby. And that's something that's hard enough to do anyway for lots of people. And her older child is literally jumping up and down next to her and probably landing with quite a thud on the floor. Now, I'm sure she wasn't enjoying that moment at the time, but I'm also sure that she loves this image and that it makes her laugh now. And this is such a wonderful thing to be able to do. We can give the gift of enjoying the moment after it's happened. And that's a very powerful thing for a client. On the bottom left, my cookie clock's going off, if you can hear that. <laughs> On the bottom left, we can see a moment where a parent and child are both trying to be in charge at the same time. Now, I've totally been there. I'm sure many of us have. And empathy is really important in these situations. It's only funny if we're empathising with the challenge faced by the parent and that we're using humour thoughtfully for the client's benefit. And finally, documentary family photography often includes aspects of street photography and here on the bottom right we can see how using composition can add humor to everyday moments now emma's going to talk more about portraits in documentary sessions yes all parents love portraits of their children so um, i actually love taking portraits as well so they're still a really important part of a documentary session that um but our portraits don't fit into the classical rules of a perfectly exposed face with eye contact. By interpreting the term a little more liberally, we can create results that are both stunning and so much more meaningful. Because sessions are longer, we really get time to see firsthand what makes people tick and how they interact with their surroundings and with each other. You really get to know people's personalities and combining these observations with creative compositions and really good use of light we can construct really beautiful unusual portraits that are infused with details that celebrate the individual this selection of images here really illustrates the concept of a great envir environmental portrait they reference the peculiar character traits and hilarious unselfconscious behavior of children in a way that a traditional portrait can't, perhaps a fascination with strange toys or odd clothing choices, um, and lots of time spent on the floor upside down. We call that the floppy kid syndrome. And for clients, these portraits make really beautiful framed prints that are a real talking point much more akin to contemporary art than a big smiling face so you can see why families love what they get from this genre and um, but it's not all plain sailing is it alice absolutely not no clients love the varied personal images that we deliver but because documentary family photography is not formulaic at all in its approach it actually makes it really challenging for us as photographers so emma can you talk us through some of the challenges that you encounter yeah, there's no chance at all of ever getting stuck in the rut with um, documentary shoots. Everything's always different. In particular, light and location can make the job challenging. You can see here, there's lots of dark images, nighttime and different locations that you just wouldn't expect. Um, you might get lucky and part of your session could be bathed in golden evening night, light. But realistically, you're much more likely to encounter rain, brutal midday sun, artificial or mixed lighting, and even almost darkness if you're staying on a full day in the life and um, you're on a bedtime um, part of the day. Likewise, you might hit the jackpot and find yourself in a really huge, spacious, light-filled home, but I guarantee you 90% of the time you'll find yourself in a dark cottage or a small terrace in a playground, the supermarket, or even a bowling alley or something like that. Every session is like stepping into the unknown, basically. And you have to be technically skilled up, know your equipment inside out, and be ready to manipulate it to make the most of any situation. Diana, can you talk us through the challenge of dealing with chaos in general? Yes. So other than working in small, dark homes or places, there's also that unpredictable nature in documentary family shoots. 
where you might get fast moving kids running around in the home or maybe a dad throwing a bucket of water over a, ch a child in the garden during a water play fight. These are moments that you just can't plan for during a family shoot. Getting to know your camera. So inside out is very important. So you're ready to capture all those different scenarios. And also it helps you to get more depth and context to your photos, which is particularly important for um, fam documentary family photos. Equally, it helps to slow down during the photo shoots, taking the time to observe the family, what they're doing and how they're interacting with each other. You don't actually need to capture everything. And it's sometimes these unexpected moments that are taking place that you actually need to be photographing because it says more about the family and what it means to them. So slowing down, letting those moments unfold, and this allows you to see the beauty in the everyday chaos and capture all the details that are happening that you just wouldn't get if you were directing the family. Now, Antonina, you have something to say about preparing families and building that client's trust, don't you? Yes, definitely. It's really important to build the trust uh, with your clients. I mean, I've had families that would first come to me um, for a session and they might have liked the idea of documentary, but were not fully prepared uh, for the chaos uh, and, and sort of real life of it. Uh, but once they've met me, they worked with me and they would see that I can create beautiful images, even if not everything goes to plan. Uh, as it never does, <laughs> then they would get go on you know, the following year to book a full day in a live photo shoot or still a shorter documentary session, but they would be then ready to embrace, um, you know, their real life and really let me capture it all. Um, so yes, building that trust with clients is super important uh, and you can do it through um, lots of different ways, um, starting first from you know, for your potential clients of having a portfolio of strong, artful documentary images on your website um, that will make your clients feel confident, not only in your ability as a photographer, but also in the very fact that you regularly capture real life of different families. Um, and when it comes to working with each individual family, uh, you definitely, Alice mentioned that before, you need to prepare them ahead of time and have a conversation with them, either on the phone, on a video call, uh, or even some photographers meet their future clients face to face uh, in person. Um, I often tell clients during those consultations that I'm not there to judge them. I'm not going to judge their parenting style or the state of their house. I'm a bit like a doctor, I've seen it all, nothing can faze me, and that kind of lets them off the hook a little bit and they, they can relax and just be themselves. Um, and during the actual shoot as well, it's really important not to be the fly on the wall. I think there's this misconception that you have to be sort of this paparazzi in the corner with a long lens in order to sort of capture moments. But actually, uh, being in the middle of, an action, of the action, you know, playing with the kids, putting your camera down sometimes, uh, having a conversation with the parents really helps people relax. And that's when they notice you actually less as a photographer and will reward you with allowing you to capture those more raw and intimate images that are absolute photographic gold um, in return. So hopefully by now you're all really inspired and you can see that there's a big opportunity for documentary family photography. Um, and it's a way to differentiate yourself and stand out in the larger um, family photography arena. So Alice, can you offer some advice on how you can dip your toes into the genre? Sure. So first of all, just practice the approach as much as you can, because it can take quite a long time to get the hang of it sometimes, to get the feel of it. So you could arrange some portfolio shoots with your own client base or in your local community, or you could just shoot your own family. You can also arrange to tag on extra time at the end of a client session. And secondly, forget what you think your clients want you to create for them and tune into what you want to shoot and what stories you want to tell. Technically, slowing down your shooting can really help with this. And then start to rethink your framing and start to include more context into your images and technically stopping down can help here. And as we said earlier, you never know what light or space you might have to work with, what might happen next. You never know. So practice shooting in different light levels, practice shooting in small spaces and with fast changing moments. That way you're building your technical skill set so that you're ready for anything. And once you do that, you, that will really help with your confidence as well. 
Yes, um, and another really important thing, um, I think, is to shift your mindset and embrace imperfection. And if you come from a more lifestyle or traditional uh, family photography background, that can be a difficult psychological shift to make. And it can take you a while to actually unlearn quite a few things. Um, but you have to remember that it's a long game and it does require some dedication to the genre to, and to fully explore it and its limitations and, and benefits. Um, and finally, one of the best ways to learn as a documentary family photographer is to get your work critiqued. Um, you know, you can't really buy a posing guide um, <laughs> because we don't pose people. Um, so to, you know, to have to improve as a photographer, it might be scary, but you need to put your work in front of experienced documentary family photographers or even photojournalists. Um, the purpose of critiques is not to critique you or your work as such, but it's to have a fresh set of eyes on the pictures from someone who's not emotionally invested in them. Uh, and they can point out things that work, uh, but also things that you need to change um, and, and do differently the next time a similar situation arises. Yeah, so, and um, how can you actually sh uh, shift your client base? Um, the good news is that there's been a, a clear increase in this demand uh, in the demand for this genre. <coughs> so if you can see yourself moving in this direction, your priority needs to be investing time in building a strong documentary portfolio, which we've already mentioned. So you can use it on your website and social media. And on top of the actual portfolio, you need to make sure that everything you write reinforces the message so that you can educate old clients and attract the right new clients. If you already have a client base as a family lifestyle photographer, for example, there are ways that you can soften the switch for clients that are loyal and gently introduce them to the idea of documentary photography. Alice mentioned that you can start by tagging a little extra time onto your sessions. So rather than meeting at a location, start at the home, end at the home, and make the outdoor lifestyle section as free and undirected as possible. You can offer shorter documentary sessions. Um, these will be longer than a lifestyle session, but it will give a family a chance to experience how a documentary session works. And more importantly, they'll see the results. Some clients can't imagine how you could possibly create beautiful, artful images out of ordinary life unless they've actually seen it for themselves. But really the best way is to have a proper conversation, get on the phone or get face to face and educate. Your enthusiasm and your, impassion, your passion for the genre will actually win people over. You may also have experience working in a reportage wedding field. Um, this is a kind of close cousin to the family um, documentary genre and be interested to, um, in adding family work to your portfolio. Um, Diana, you work in weddings as well. Have you got any advice um, about how documentary family work differs and how you can bridge, bridge those differences? Yes, of course. So if you're already a wedding photographer, you'll be used to shooting a whole day and know how big and special these occasions are. But there's also these occasions and moments in the everyday that are just as valuable to document too. And as Antonina mentioned, it's not until over time that you realize how the meaning of these family photos will grow. If you're already shooting with a reportage or photojournalistic style, then you'll already be capturing and used to capturing the candid moments over the more posed wedding photos. So you're already in that sort of best fit style-wise for family documentary work. But documentary family shoots differ from planned wedding days because family shoots, family life is not all planned. It's not always full of happy moments. There are also some raw, messy and often challenging times as well. So amongst the fun, you might encounter things that happen unexpectedly that aren't always perfect. Um, and it's about letting those um, those moments flow and ready to embrace and capture the family everyday chaos. 
Um, and also just remember that families do not expect you to deliver hundreds of photographs like you would in a wedding, um, even for a full day in a life shoot. So you can be a bit more selective in what you're shooting and really waiting for those more interesting moments to take place and looking beyond the obvious to make photos that truly tell the story of this family. So you can see lifestyle and wedding reportage genres, they, they obviously all have their own value, but they are slightly different um, to a greater or lesser extent to family documentary photography. So you need to allow time to explore before, before deciding whether it's right for you. But most importantly, once you do make the decision to transition, you need to be wary of using the term documentary too early and make sure you're fully committed to building a strong truthful portfolio first if you're talking about life being imperfectly perfect then you have to represent life honestly without manipulation before or after the fact of taking the photograph you need to trust in the process and work within the constraints Continue. yes um another major pitfall um i urge you all to avoid is underpricing your work in documentary family photography I mean, it really applies to all genres, obviously, but in documentary family photography in particular, I think sometimes newer photographers think it's easy um, or because they think just because you're capturing real life, people are not going to pay for it. Um, so they don't price it accordingly. Uh, well, as you hopefully have seen by now, um, this genre actually requires quite a lot of skill, uh, experience and visual literacy to get right. Uh, and the shoots are also typically longer than your sort of shorter uh, lifestyle or portrait session. Uh, and so is post-production because there are just so many more images to get through. Um, I mean, these photo shoots can sometimes even be longer than a wedding. So like a day in a life uh, is from breakfast until bedtime. And when you have small kids, it's like 12 to 14 hours, whereas a, an average wedding is like eight to 10 hours. Um, but it's not only the time, you know, the value of these images does increase with time uh, and, you know, those everyday boring moments become ever more precious as the kids get older uh, and become so much more meaningful to the family. Uh, and yes, I can absolutely reassure you that there are clients who are willing to pay good money for these kinds of images. So please don't underprice yourself. Don't go around charging 300 quid for a day in a life photo shoot, you're going to be shooting yourself on the foot. Um, it's really important to do your math properly and charge accordingly if you want to build your business and your work around this genre. And I can take, I can talk for hours about pricing, and that's something that we do a lot in our community. But as time we start wrapping up and actually answer some of your questions. Uh, but before we do, oh, let me see. Oh, my slides are not changing. What's happening? <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, if you want to learn more about both the shooting and the business side of documentary family photography, do join our community on Facebook. Uh, we have regular chats there about all of that. We um, have interviews, which we call Zoom casts, with various photographers, uh, image critiques, um, you know, so you can learn about uh, how to make strong photographs. Um, and if you go to makefordocumentary.com forward slash TPS, you can download um, the summary of this presentation with a few extra tips and resources to help you grow as documentary family photographer and learn more about this genre. Now we're going to turn to questions. Uh, just give me a moment until I to open that um, little separate page <laughs> with them. So just bear well, with me. Well, Antina's finding um, all your questions. Some of you, I think, will be watching after Sunday on Catch Up. So obviously, we won't, you won't be able to answer questions then. But Antina's just um, put up the details of our Facebook community. So do join there. And if you have any questions you'd love to ask us, then just um, pop them in the group and we'll answer them there. OK. Let me just scroll for the questions. Um... So Jesse's asking, how long do you normally spend with each family and also how much do you interact with them during this time? I think we kind of answered that a little bit, didn't we? Yeah, every family. Sorry, Emma. Sorry, I was going to say every photographer um, has their own way of um, dividing up the, the days. Um, so 
you tend, you tend to find that people will do half days or full days, but also a lot of people do a shorter session as well, which is like a taster session, which I think I was um, alluding to at the end, where it's quite a good system for getting people used to the idea of a documentary session. Um, okay, so another question from Emma. Uh, do you have a particular lens or camera set up that you have found work best? um we so systems don't we yeah so, so i think you so yeah i'm canon this is what happens when we all trying to talk at the same time sorry <laughs> so um we all use different systems but you tend to find that people tend to use lenses like a 35 but i use a 35 most of the time i use a 24 if i find myself like on a trampoline or in a small room or in a car but 90% of my sheets are 35. But I remember you like to use um, a different focal length most of the time, don't you? Yeah, I, I'm like, I use the same two focal lengths, but I have a preference for 24 and I'll use 35 sometimes. So it's kind of, it's very similar, <laughs> but um, I like the, um, I like the slightly exaggerated weird effect of um, a 24 lens and the fact that you can incorporate so much of a story with a wider lens. So I really like that and it's also, super useful in small uk ho homes yeah um, you know mm. in a tiny room but i think all of us and tend Diana, to shoot with primes sorry yeah and uh, we all yeah we all shoot with uh on full frame i mean um antonina and emma you you're both mirrorless and i'm i'm on a nikon um d750 uh which is really good at handling low light um super important um as well as the prime lenses as well um yeah because um we don't i don't believe all of you do um we we don't use flash um in even that for bedtimes um because we're trying to capture the ambience um on and which really helps to tell the story of the family photo shoot you've used and also with particularly kids young kids it can sort of kind of throw them off a bit so um yeah so having shooting on a full frame um really helps and also the prime lenses as well yeah we yeah, talked earlier about reasons. you move your, yourself and you move your feet and you move your camera to frame we don't zoom in and out i think we all feel that it's you, you get in the flow of the documentary approach much more when you can't zoom in and out where you have to move yourself so i think using a prime actually technically helps you um work within the constraints of the genre one of the yeah. things i particularly um, love about um, the 24 lens is that um you can go in super close because it's so wide you can get in really really close and get right into the action um and and it really feels like you're there um and that's that's one of the main reasons why i i use it um and it, yeah i think that really yeah i think helps. ultimately it's not the camera obviously it's the sofa uh, but there are some mm. things that you you know that help like you know having full frame or having really a good sensor that can capture you can go really high on iso um mm -hmm. mirrorless also helps emma and i have switched to sony mirrorless uh last year um yeah. and it's lighter there's a screen this sort of means you can sort of shoot a little bit um, more freer um, in that regard we have another question um so do would you recommend locations for a shoot when you're working with a client or do you leave that entirely to the family yeah we so tend I, to have more suggested activities than um than suggested locations you'll tend to be working around a, a client's normal day um so that will be in the house and whatever happens during the day but on a shorter session will will suggest ideas um just um in a long session you just have to trust the process there's time for things to happen and unravel and unfold naturally on a smaller session you might suggest some activities like going to the playground or shopping or um trampolining something like that so that you know that there's going to be something happening while you're with the client but you don't suggest locations it's about what they would do naturally that's where that guess, it differs yeah. quite extremely from lifestyle the one exception is, I guess I, yeah, I feel I suggest home as a location because it's it's often the last place people think of being photographed because they think my home does not look like the John Lewis catalogue or 
you know, a photo shoot set. And it's educating people and talking to people, convincing that actually that is the very best place because it's the natural backdrop to their children's childhood. So, yeah, I sometimes try and push for home sessions a bit more than going yeah. to the park. Diana, what about you? Um, yeah, so I was just going to say that it all, it really depends on um, how, how sort of on the spectrum of documentary family photography you, you shoot. So I'm, I'm really photojournalistic in that I don't um, recommend things, um, activities or anything. Obviously, that, um, as Anthony has said early on, is um, that preparation and speaking with your clients um, before the shoot itself. Um, really helps just discussing about where they see their memories lying with the kids where they like to spend time together you know all those mostly take place in the home so and um it's not like i suppose lifestyle sessions where i uh able to pre um visit the the place i don't and that's that's kind of in a way, the beauty and excitement and challenge of it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't um, discuss. Um, yeah, just get an idea. Obviously, where I'm going to turn up for the photo shoot itself. But otherwise, um, whatever happens, happens. I say I just go with the yeah. flow of the day. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> photograph quite a lot of um, people who come visit London on their holidays, um, and then because they simply because they have no idea what's possible where they could go we will discuss some sort of um order to the day uh, and i might suggest a few uh, locations that they might go sightseeing in so it's not so much a location for the shoot but it's more of a you know what can you go see with your kids today and i will capture that um yeah. we have a few more questions we have more a bit more time, right? We have about three minutes left. <laughs> there are some big questions. But there's one um, someone asked about, um, you know, finding clients. What's the best way to gain new clients, and how much repeat business do you get? And it's such a huge question, Anna, that um, I would really suggest that you join our Facebook group where we can sort of pick it up because we can talk about that for an hour just about that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's just very easy. The, um, the best way to get people to book a documentary session is to show them images, to show what you want to shoot, which is why we talked I about building that, your portfolio first. Yeah, I mean, def definitely website, um, because that's where you're going to be showing mostly your images. Rather than, I mean, yes, uh, possibly Instagram would help as well. I'm not so sure people use so much look at Facebook as as well for photographers now um you know just sharing what what you normally photograph and even for yourself if you have family you know to f show how you photograph your families because you know most most of us are sort of yeah parents and and have family and that we photograph them quite a lot so it shows that aspect of how you would normally photograph um your kids yeah people yeah. can understand the well, speaking of is kids, to go ahead emma yeah. No, I was just going to say one of the key is like everyone said is, is you have to have the right images and, and be consistent with your images of what you're showing. Um, if you transition into the field, it's really confusing for clients if they're seeing a mix of different things and, and so that they don't quite know where you sit or what they're going to get. Um, so it's really important to narrow that down um, and be um, consistent and strong with, with what you're putting yeah. forward. Yeah, it's and in terms of repeating well, um, oh, sorry, Alice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's fine to have a small portfolio for a while if you're transitioning genres. Then build it up. It's much better to do that than have two types of image. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was just going to say that in terms of repeat business, once clients trust you, they really want to stick with you. So um, that really does help. There's a lot of repeat business. Uh, another and question, actually, around children. Or Diana, were you going to say something? Uh, I was just going to quickly add on to uh, that part, but also referring to um, the answer that Emma gave in the first question about, um, so if you're just starting and um, found a client might book you, but they're not sure whether to go for half day, full day, you know, it's okay to go for the two hours, but maybe just eke out a little bit longer and just, you know, don't have that sort of time constraint of, okay, done, two hours. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, and allow yourself to then build your portfolio and, um, yeah, get, get the family used to, you know, relaxing, doing a shoot. Um, cool. So we have a couple actually questions about how many images do you give from a session? 
Alice. So I guess one of the thing is, things is because we have different lengths of sessions, what we don't do is give twice as many images for the session that's twice as long and then three times one that's three times as long. The longer sessions, we slow down and we pace ourselves. Um, I think we one of the hardest things is to is to get better at culling and give fewer images. But I think that's true in every genre. Um, but the golden mm -hmm. rule is never tell your clients how many you're going to give them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you will, you know, there, there is an awful lot of variety. Um, because, um, if you're shooting lifestyle and you're going to a specific location um, just for a specific amount of time, um, there's a limited array of images that you can draw from that. In a day um, at home with activities going on where you might leave the house and come back, there's eating, bath time, playing in the garden, jobs around the house. Um, there's, there's a huge opportunity to create a really wide range of images. Um, so you can be, like Diana said, you can slow down and really cherry pick the best moments and the really great pictures. You don't want hundreds of the same thing. That's that's a difference in this genre. It's, it's variety. So you might not be, you're not going to be giving them hundreds of images. It's still a gallery that's going to keep them interested and peppered with interesting different images. Yeah, I, I, I prefer to say that it's not about the quantity, it's the quality, and it's about giving, and I explained that it's it's about telling the narrative. Uh, so it's that story of that family life. Um, and so it's not about presenting the same images of the same people smiling or laughing or whatever. It's it's that really tight cull. Um, so yeah, not, not a huge amount, but it, again, it all really depends on the length of the day that you're yeah. photographing. Uh, like with a day in a life, I would say that sometimes you don't, there's, there are hours when nothing much happens and then there's no image, like you don't have to provide a minute by minute sort of record of the mm. day. It's not what it's about at, at all. Um, I think we only have a couple more minutes left before we're going to be cut off. So <laughs> there's, um, <laughs> let me just, <laughs> like if we don't get to answer all the questions, please do join us on Facebook. Just look for Made for Documentary, the community, and we have lots of conversa conversations there. I think just one final question that I'm going to ask before we say goodbye. Um, it's we kind of talked a little bit about that, but Jesse is asking, how do you get the children to relax around you enough that you can observe and capture without becoming part of their day? Um, Emma. Yeah, I think Antonina mentioned this earlier. Um, and again, it's not about capturing every minute of the day. You're going to have times where things aren't happening and actually getting involved with the family, sitting, chatting, having a cup of tea, playing with the children, um, they'll start welcoming you as um, as a friend um, or part of the family or start behaving like you're not really there as somebody special or somebody different. Um, and just behave, and, the lo and, and this is the beauty of actually doing longer documentary sessions, the longer you're there, the less they notice you and the more they get used to your, your presence and start behaving in just just as they would if you weren't there and then you can really observe those funny things that you're interested in in um capturing like the difference different behavior of different children in the same room or children doing things when they when the parent's back is turned um, you know those sort of things the longer you're there the more that will just start to unravel and happen naturally yeah uh, is, Alice, there, is there a quick moment to oh, no, say something Sorry. So, uh, yeah, and I was just going to say that um, as well for teenagers, family, all, you know, it's, it's just as important, as I said, to to photograph them before the kids grow up, before the kids leave home. So teenagers as well, you, you get those type of uh, photograph shoots, which is, is hard, but um, if they want to do their own things or if they want to play or even small children, if they want to play a bit of their, I don't know, Xbox games, that's what my children are into at the moment, you know, that's fine. And that's partly the beauty of these longer sessions is that um, it's not all going to be about that. Um, but um, even in those moments, you can get different perspectives um, to to shoot some really creative photographs so you know don't panic that something's not always happening um, kids might not always be really bouncy and lively running around um, you know photograph through the quiet moments as well those are equally as important and, and this is something that you do when you're in the prep stage with your um 
with your clients is that you ex you would prepare them that you're not going to be shooting every single moment that part of it you'll be stepping back and watching and waiting for the moment so to let them know to expect you to be going in and out of photographing yeah um i think we probably are out of time right now so thank you everyone for tuning in for asking questions we hope you found it useful and do come and join us and find us on our website and on facebook thank you. we can talk, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. talk thank you. thank you